So I want you all to keep this in mind for those of you who are, uh, really enjoy barbershop singing here. Barbershop chapters in town, all of them, Sweet Adeline's as well as the men's chapters on Valentine's Day, have little sing-outs where uh, you can, like $25 or something like that, get a red rose and a quartet to come by your sweetheart's home or place of business, and we'll sing a couple of love songs to her. Among some of the songs we sing are something like Heart of my heart, I love you. Always a warm occasion. So, for Valentine's Day and all you sweethearts out there, here's a song from us. Heart of my heart, I love you. Life would be not without you. Light of my Thank you, another sweet love song here. History-making meeting of the City Club of Portland. I'm Jim Westwood, your president. We're starting a bit early because we have so much to put into our program today. I'm glad to see a full house here. 80 Cent Lunch had nothing to do with it. I know that uh, you're all fascinated to be here. I'm certainly glad to be here today. This, this is, uh, as I say, a, a history-making occasion. We're beginning our 75th anniversary today. And what better way than to, to begin a 75th anniversary looking to the future than to introduce our new members. Seated in the audience today, I'd like them to stand as I, uh, as I introduce you, and please hold your applause until I've introduced all of our new members. Larry Abb, Fiscal Manager, Multnomah County Sheriff's Office. Susan Robinson, Senior Systems Auditor, Northwest Natural Gas. And Steve Tillingast, Chief, Chief Deputy, Multnomah County Sheriff's Office. Welcome to City Club. You're the future of the club, and we're glad to have you here. Thank you also to our recruiter, Ruth Robinson. And also thanks to Bruce Buffington and the Cordial Blend Barbershop Quartet for the really wonderful musical introduction to this 1916 event luncheon, the first of our four events to celebrate City Club's 75th anniversary. Prior to this program, City Club members and Benson Hotel staff participated in the dedication of a beautiful brass plaque that's permanently affixed to the wall outside the Mayfair room here at the Benson. The plaque commemorates the long-standing association between the club and the Benson. The Benson has been the most frequent home of the City Club's Friday programs throughout its 75-year history, and we're proud to have been participating with the Benson through that. Please notice that plaque as you leave the room today. Also, before we begin, I want to welcome special guests from the Benson Hotel who are with us today. They're David Higginbottom, Terry Higginbottom, Larry Button, Jamie Sexton, and Bob Parsons. Welcome. David Higginbottom is the manager of the Benson, and I want to, uh, through you, David, thank Benson for your generous co-sponsorship of this luncheon. As well, I want to thank the 17 corporate and partnership sponsors listed on the large board at the back of the room who have also helped sponsor the 75th anniversary celebrations of the City Club. Thanks, too, to the members of the luncheon from the past committee, the Living Gift Logo Committee, for their efforts in putting the program today together. Committee members are listed in your program. And thanks also to Pacific Power, David Kwame and Mark Fletcher for technical assistance, and of course to the Oregon Historical Society, and Jean Brim and the Northwest Horseless Carriage Club for their assistance today. You saw the horseless carriages parked outside the Benson as you came in today, I'm sure. Before we move ahead, I'd like to acknowledge other special members among us, those who've helped keep City Club vital through loyal membership participation over a long span of years. And I'd like to ask those of you in the audience today who have been members for 25 years or longer, Please to stand so we can recognize you and thank you for your long participation. Please stand. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, now that we've done that, I think maybe many of the same group may be standing again. I'd like to have all the past presidents of City Club, and I've seen a bunch of them coming in today, to stand and be recognized for their contributions to the club over the years. Would all the past presidents please stand? Next week, October 4th, the 75th anniversary event number two. Please join us, not at the Benson, but at Pioneer Courthouse Square for City Club's first ever community-wide town hall meeting. Join us as citizens and state, county, and city elected officials face off on the burning issues that challenge Portland's future. The program is co-sponsored by KATU-TV and will be taped for broadcast for KATU's town hall program on October 6th. Prepaid box lunches can be ordered by bringing your check for $9.50 to the club office by 5 p.m. next Monday, September 30th. You also have the option of bringing your own lunch, or you can purchase a lunch from one of the happy vendors nearby in Pioneer Square. With or without lunch, though, next Friday, October 4th, please join us for this community-wide event. It won't rain, will it? But if it does, rain contingency will be meeting at the Masonic Temple. The deadline for ordering tickets for our October 18th gala dinner with Dick Cavett is October 10th. See I'm sorry. <laughs> Gretchen Lashley is our board host today. She's a member of the Board of Governors. She'll ask the first question of our speaker. Second question today will be asked by Patrick Donaldson, Chair of the Law and Public Safety Standing Committee. After that, of course, we open up the floor to questions city, from City Club members in the audience. Well, since it's members only today, I think that's a, I don't need to say that. Written questions can be asked as time permits, and you have forms on your tables for the written questions. I should also say the historic postcards on your tables You'll have to wrist wrestle or flip coins or something, but those are for you to take home. Whoever at your table would like to take them, you're welcome to them at the close of today's um, program. On to today's program, and it is an, a joyous occasion, and this is going to be fun. Our speakers today need no introduction, as they say, Terence O'Donnell and Thomas Vaughn. Mr. O'Donnell is a native Oregonian, historian, author, and lecturer. He uh, narrates stories of early Oregon history and of Portland history, as well as those of the present day scene. Mr. O'Donnell, I think, is one of those rare combinations in an historian. He's also a, a humanist and a poet, and he sees the history of Oregon through the eyes of a poet. I, I really think this is going to be a wonderful presentation today, and Terrence, we're glad to have you here. He has written many books, uh, among them his soon to be published, An Arrow in the Earth, the story of Joel Palmer and the Oregon Indian Wars. I'm looking forward to the release of that book. Also at our head table today, one of our speakers, Thomas Vaughn, former executive director of the Oregon Historical Society for 35 years, a former city club member, a mem former member of the Board of Governors, Oregon's historian laureate. I will have to ask Mr. Vaughn why he is a former city club member uh, later on, but we'll, we'll deal with that. <laughs> I think with, I don't want to take any more time with introductions because this is going to be a fun program today. I just would like to introduce our first speaker with a show for the history of Portland, Terrence O'Donnell. Mr. O'Donnell.
Thank you very much, Mr. Westwood. Um, adjust all the paraphernalia here. I'm afraid I might swallow it if I get too, too close to it. Well, good afternoon. I'd like to begin <clears throat> by uh, thanking you uh, for asking me to come today. Also, I'd like to apologize for the fragmentary uh, nature of this little slideshow, the restrictions of time uh, permitting only a few glimpses into the city's past, <clears throat> little vistas, really, rather than a grand and panoramic view. I'd also like to apologize to the radio audience for not describing in detail the contents of each slide. Again, there simply isn't time. However, I'll try and uh, give a caption, as it were, to each of the slides and hope that your imaginations uh, may complete the scene. Finally, I'd like to thank the Oregon Historical Society, particularly Susan Sile and George Champlin, and the Portland Planning Commission, particularly John Neal, for the photos from which the slides are taken. Before going on to the slides, uh, I want to talk a little about Portland's historical footings, the substratum out of which, in time, the city came to be. And to do this, I have to go back to that May morning in 1792 when an American uh, ex-pirate named Robert Gray crashed through the breakers into the estuary of that river, which he named for his little ship, the Columbia. Now the news of this discovery piqued the curiosity of that very inquiring man, Mr. Thomas Jefferson who chose two young army officers, Captains Lewis and Clark, to go overland to the Columbia, which they did, spending the winter there of 1804 and 5. Next on the scene was John Jacob Astor, who established a fur trading post at the mouth in 1810, calling it Astoria, the first American community in the West. <clears throat> the post, however, did not prosper, and eventually came into the hands of the Hudson's Bay Company, uh, which under the local direction of Dr. John McLaughlin moved the headquarters upriver in 19, 1824 to a place he called Fort Vancouver. Then in 1842, McLaughlin established another settlement at the falls of the Willamette, calling it Oregon City. As might be expected, there was travel between these two settlements, the only settlements in the wilderness of the Northwest, travel between these two settlements, and it is with this travel <clears throat> that Portland's history begins. It happened one autumn morning, 1843, when two young men set out in a canoe from Fort Vancouver for Oregon City. It's a Lovejoy, graduate of Amherst, and William Overton, whom a contemporary described as a desperate, rollicking fellow. <clears throat> and indeed, it is said he ended his career at the end of a rope in California. <laughs> now, about halfway along their journey, these fellows, the gentlemen in the scallywag, uh, beached their canoe at a place called The Clearing, located at what is now uh, the downtown waterfront. Uh, the clearing was what we euphemistically call a rest stop. <laughs> and indeed, I must remind you that there are certain things one cannot do from a canoe. <clears throat> that the City of Roses owes its origin <laughs> to such a base necessity <laughs> is embarrassing. But then the past, like the present, often is embarrassing. <laughs> In any event, after comforting themselves, as it were, the young men looked around and decided the place might be a good spot on which to file uh, a land claim, and that is what they did. However, the restless Overton uh, soon went off to California and the noose and um, bartered before that half his claim to another New Englander, uh, Francis Pettigrove. And now these two, Lovejoy and, and uh, Pettigrove, these two Yankees, now set out to develop their claim into a town site in 1844, building a log store and tavern at the foot of what is now Jefferson, uh, sorry, Washington Street, 
And the following year, uh, platting the place into 16 little blocks from the river to Second and Jefferson to Washington. If I may have the lights dim, please. Thank you. Uh, now to the, um, the famous coin was flipped to determine what name the place would bear, Lovejoy's hometown of Boston or Pettigrove's Portland, Maine. Uh, in these first years, um, Portland did not prosper. The wagon train uh, immigrants were farmers, not interested in town lots. However, a New England uh, sea captain, John Cooch, um, determined uh, that Portland was the head of navigation for ocean-going ships rather than Portland's chief competitor, Oregon City. And this was very important. Another man, Daniel Lounsdale, drove a road of sorts through a canyon in the hills into the rich farmlands of the Tualatin Valley, today's Canyon Road, of course. So certain things had come together. That rich farm valley, and from that valley, a road to the river town, uh, which now had a wharf. In short, Portland had become a place where the wagons could meet the ships. Now only one thing was lacking, a market for the valley produce. Uh, this provided by the California gold rush of 1848, and the town was off. Wheat and gold, the wharf and road, sawmill, tannery, <clears throat> blacksmith, taverns of plenty, and a population of about 800. A small and beautiful village, a local judge described it. A possibly more accurate description was given uh, by an unkind lady from California, Natch, who called it a rather gamey place. <laughs> and as this shot of front and stark in 1852 suggests. Um, here is another side of front, and in the background the masts of a ship, for indeed Portland now was the principal port of the northwest coast. In the following year, the town engaged uh, in its first efforts at town planning, as this 1853 map shows showing as well those amenities and institutions which the town thought important to have. The park and plaza blocks, you can see the park blocks going right down through the center. Uh, the park and plaza blocks, uh, a lyceum where that is a cultural center, a market square, presently the auditorium square, uh, male and female seminaries, which is to say high schools, a college with the temp penitentiary adjacent an interesting <laughs> juxtaposition. Uh, five blocks of churches, four of lodges, one for a hospital, and finally, finally indeed, two cemeteries. Well, despite these um, grand plans, there was still much clutter and muck about. Uh, as this photo of 1859 of Front Street shows, why the band and the cannon perhaps to celebrate the admission of Oregon as the 33rd state in this year of 1859. By the 1860s, however, and as we see here, the town with a population of 3,000 began to look more prosperous. And indeed it was more prosperous, due in part to the gold mines of eastern Oregon and to the wheat coming down from the Columbia Plateau, and which would soon make Portland one of the great wheat ports of the world. Here, the wheat fleet uh, loading at the Portland docks. Uh, such economic activity called for banks, and here, the first national, organized by Henry Failing and Henry Corbett in 1865. Note that the town's white and wooden New England look is being replaced by the splendor of cast iron fronts. And here on the right, uh, is a shot of Henry Failing, sharp-looking young fellow, isn't he? Uh, as is his older partner, Henry Corbett. And now we go into the 1870s with a bird's-eye view of the town, reminding us of the tilt of the downtown shelf up from the river to the base of the hills. 
But the de decade, I, I fear, began with a disaster. In 1873, a fire burned 22 blocks, but um, manfully battled by the volunteer fire department. Henry Failing down there to the left in the first row, I think. In the same year, however, a phoenix rose from the ashes uh, in the form of the Pioneer Courthouse. Now it happened that a few years later, an itinerant photographer climbed to the cupola and took five pictures of the town, which give us a very good idea of what Portland looked like in the late 1870s. Uh, to the southwest, this is the crossroads of Broadway and Yam Hill. In the middle distance, the park blocks, the present elms just planted. Due west at Broadway and Morrison, the cupola of the town's first public school, now the site of Pioneer Square. To the northwest, uh, in the background, the North Park blocks running diagonally left from Broadway. If you can see them down toward in the background, park blocks running off uh, to the left of Broadway. Um, to the northwest, uh, I'm sorry, here to the northeast, looking northeast from the cupola, and um, here looking southeast. Uh, Mr. Corbett had done rather well, as his house in the foreground shows, and Mr. Failing had too, as his house in the background shows. Uh, these two blocks now the sites of the Pacific Building and the Public Service Building. Yes, the town in a mere 20 years had come a long way from that log store at the foot of Washington Street. And furthermore, it had some very distinguished citizens. Thomas Lamb Elliott a Unitarian minister who came to town as a young fellow in 1867 and who, in my judgment, did more for the town than anyone before or since. A founder of the library, fo the founder of the park systems, superintendent of schools, the founder of the Humane Society, the founder of the Boys and Girls Aid Society, the founder of Reed College, and a fearless mountaineer for whom Mount Hood's Elliott Glacier was named. And here he is, 65 years later, near the end of his life in 1932, this grand good man. Francis Fuller Victor, not a very good photograph of this extremely interesting woman, eminent 19th century historian, and the best historian Oregon has so far produced. Judge Matthew Deedy, the nationally respected jurist, and again, perhaps the best that the city has yet seen. Abigail Scott Dunaway, a leader of the suffragette movement in the United States, not just in Oregon by any means, shown here many years later, uh, after she had finally secured the vote for Oregon women in 1912, and she the first to vote appropriately. Look at the fellow giving her the eye on the left-hand side. <laughs> and so these four nationally distinguished citizens in the decade of the 1870s. Not bad for a little burg of 15,000 people out here at the end of nowhere. Now with a metropolitan population of a million, do we have such four nationally recognized Portlanders, four of such distinguished caliber? Well, on into the 1880s, Though still small, the town was rather grand in places. Here are some park block mansions, uh, present site of Portland State, and here are others on Northwest 19th Street. Big houses, big families, from baby uh, on the right uh, to grandpa on the left. Jaunty looking old goat, isn't he? And for those not part of a family, there was that practical and glorious 19th century institution, the boarding house. Here, the Markham boarding house at 6th and Alder. Yes, things were different then, though at bottom, the lives of 19th century Portlanders were really no different from our own. Uh, everyone got born. Most people uh, got married. 
and everyone got buried. <laughs> but there was, I regret to say, uh, another constant, and that was sin. The most notorious example, Miss Mary Boggs' whiskey scow and brothel, anchored out there somewhere in the middle of the river, painted a bright crimson, brazen as a harlot, and from which on summer nights came such a racket, whoops and hollers and clanging banjos and moans and groans, all echoing across the river up to the staid verandas of proper portrait, <clears throat> where the ladies raise their eyes to heaven while the gents may well have cast a furtive glance in the direction of the river. <clears throat> Yes, the river played an important part in the life of the city, not just with respect to sin, for it was the great arterial of transportation. Portland very much a river city. The docks right down at the end of the downtown streets. However, the importance of the river began to fade when in 1883, the transcontinental train reached Portland. We are now incorporated with the rest of the world, announced the Board of Trade, and indeed before the railroad, Portland was a very isolated place, and thus the joy at its arrival expressed here at first in Stark in the celebration decorations. To honor its arrival, the legendary Portland Hotel was eventually built, the present site of Pioneer Square, across the street, the new Opera House. Five years later, another event almost as important, the first bridge across the river, the Morrison. This meant that that wonderful new invention, the electric streetcar, could cross the river and thus began the development of the east side residential districts. These streetcars uh, went all over the place, uh, Gresham, Oregon City, Beaverton, here a crowd on their way to the Oaks. Me and my brothers going to the Oaks. Also, there were uh, cable cars, this one starting out at Fifth and Alder, and here climbing up into the West Hills, which now, too, in the 1890s began to develop its residential districts. Indeed, the hills would have been a good place to be <clears throat> when the flood of 1894 turned the city into a lake. But the city made the best of it, at least uh, these gents up to hijinks outside the Crystal Palace Saloon, shooting ducks. <clears throat> in general, the town really was not daunted, full of optimism and enterprise. For example, now at the turn of the century, building the Northwest's first public art museum, the present site of the Rouse Pioneer Place office uh, tower, and some years ago, the, the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, moved into it. And then um, the new library, which stood exactly where we are sitting uh, today, the precursor of the Benson. But the arts and literature were not alone in receiving attention, also science. Here the medical school, first medical school at 23rd and Lovejoy, and in which students were taught to do things like this here in the surgery at St. Vincent's. The patient about to have his leg amputated, note the wash tub placed to receive the severed limb. Well, uh, on to, that's for those who have nostalgia about the past. It wasn't a very good place, to, very good time to have your leg cut off. Well, on to cheerier subjects. Um, a sunny day at Fifth and Morrison in the first year of the new century. The town with a population now of 90,000. Pioneer Courthouse to the left, the old Myron Franks to the right, the Portland Hotel beyond. And what have we here four years later? Well, the biggest bash Portland has ever held, the Lewis and Clark Fair, down there at the end of Vaughn Street, lots of roses and electric lights, Eden up to date. And speaking of roses, following the fair in 1907, the first Rose Festival was held. For yes, the city had chosen the rose for its symbol. Other cities might favor the smokestack or the dynamo, but not Portland. For after all, was not Portland the capital of Eden. And indeed, this uh, 1912 shot of the city from Piggott's Castle suggests a pleasant place. And one, by the way, in which the population now had jumped to 200,000. A closer view of the city, uh, its center still greened by the trees of the Corbett and failing mansion blocks. And here a more extended view 
and a very important one, for this is the city in 1916, and we all know the significance of that, the year that the City Club uh, was founded. In many ways, I, I think this period between the fair and World War I was Portland's golden age, a buoyancy of spirit and a love for the city, which I don't think has ever been matched. Listen to this from the uh, 1910 New Year's editorial of the Oregon Journal. Uh, by the way, the Oregon Journal then was one of five daily papers uh, in Portland. And the, or or the uh, journal stated, in all essentials that make for human comfort and happiness, we are blessed beyond compare. Well, nothing lasts, of course, and it was just about now that something occurred which in time would slow the beat of the downtown's heart. From the beginning, people had lived and worked, worshipped and sinned at the center of the town. Now they were being drawn away from the center, and as they went, so too the center's compression, vigor, and color began to fade. Yes, the automobile, here in the form of a bus. Uh, this meant regulation, of course. Uh, the speed limit, by the way, had now grudgingly been raised from 8 to 10 miles per hour. So we leave an epic closed by World War I. The following decade, the 1920s, was one of prosperity for Portland, and with that prosperity came handsome additions to the downtown. For example, the Pacific Building on the Corbett Block and the Public Service Building on the former uh, Failing Block. But look, the, the, oh, the old stables of the Corbett Mansion still standing. I remember those, in fact, as a, as a child. Uh, the prosperity, however, was not to last, for the Great Depression arrived at the end of the decade, and we, like other cities, had our soup kitchens, the famous grandma's kitchen. Another sadness in the 1930s, at least in the view of some, such as myself, is that we lost the downtown harbor, replaced by a highway, <clears throat> the port moved downriver to its present location. World War II ended the Depression in Portland by virtue of the shipyards. And now, leaving the past and coming into the present, there is this. In 1951, the Portland Hotel was raised uh, to make of this, the city's most central block, a parking lot. Yes, the present had arrived indeed. Not long after, freeways would encircle the city, as this shot shows. And they would connect with a mini freeway, which now had replaced the old waterfront. But something else is happening, too. And as this photo shows, 54 blocks of the downtown southeast quadrant marked off. And for what? For urban renewal, which began at the end of the 1950s, all 54 blocks raised to create Portland Center, one of the most successful urban renewals, uh, by the way, in the country. Indeed, from now on, the downtown would renew itself in several ways. But before going to these and the slides which illustrate them, a word of caution. The co coming slides are in color and taken by professional photographers to bring out all the glamour of each subject, PR photos in short. By comparison, the slides you've already seen have been muddy and grainy, black and white, and most of the subjects shown in their true homeliness. This might lead you to conclude that the Portland past was a drab affair and the present downtown more alive and attractive than it has ever been. And you would be quite wrong. For the downtown in the 19th and early 20th century was a far more vital and healthy place than it is uh, today. Uh, for one thing, there was no problem of air pollution. Also, the downtown streets were uh, bowered in trees. And in this dark town, with its average of 270 days of overcast a year, there was far more light for the average building height was two or three stories, no more. Also, almost everyone could walk to work, walk home for lunch, walk right out into the countryside if they wished. On the other hand, if they wanted public transport, it was far more comprehensive and convenient than today. 
Next, there was that diversity, which we hear so much of today, but of which really we have so little. Then in the downtown, there were the cottages and houses of the middle class, the mansions of the rich, the people who loved, lived above their shops, then add the sailors from the downtown waterfront, loggers from Burnside, the Chinese from 2nd Street, 1.2nd largest Chinese population in the nation, soldiers from Fort Vancouver, farmers into town for the day. And finally this, the streets were thronged, the true sign of vitality in an American downtown. This photo does not seem thronged with persons, but I think it must have been Sunday morning and all Portlanders, of course, were in church or at temple. <laughs> and now on to the present, which does uh, indeed look pretty good, but remember the past wasn't all that bad either. Here we have Portland Center, a shot of it, which uh, took place in, in those 54 blocks that was raised. Here, uh, before and after of front, it's the old journal building and the highway that went along the waterfront, now the park which has taken its place. Um, then, of course, the malls, the Fifth and Strict Extreme Malls. And then the square. Uh, this is before and after, above the parking lot, below the square for, the, for that spring uh, flower, uh, flower show. And then uh, Max, of course. Well, to finish, there we were. Here we are. The late Kevin Lynch once wrote that a city uh, should be time deep time deep. What he meant by that, I suppose, was that we must have both uh, continuity and change, that both are good, both the courthouse cupola and the high-rise towers. Good because they give us variety, good too for reminding us that we are only passing through, that there were others here before us, and that others will be here after all of us have gone. And it seems to me that for this reason, remembering with due regard those others, those who have left, those who are yet to come, that we have a double charge, and that charge is to both guard the city's past and foster the city's future. To guard the past and foster the future. Thank you for your kind attention. to follow, but I have every confidence that our next speaker will do very well at that. We have all heard, or most of us I'm sure have heard Tom Vaughn speak before. He brings to Oregon history a vibrancy, a liveliness, a currency that makes us think about where we're headed and the future. And so without further ado, I present to you Thomas Vaughn. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President and distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen of the City Club, <laughs> and Terrence. <laughs> what an act to follow. Well, I wanted to be with Terrence on this program, and uh, how could I have forgotten how good he is? It's very difficult. I was amused this morning. I was preparing my talk. I was writing it, which is unlike me, early this morning. And, uh, and my wife was here, Elizabeth. I heard her through the door of the study saying, scribble, 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 eh, Mr. Gibbon? Which is what George III said to the great Gibbon, historian of Rome. And I was scribbling furiously, I must say. And then I was easing myself into this suit 
from 1951, <laughs> which I wore to my job interviews here in Portland in the spring of 1954. And I was thinking about an extraordinary acquaintance of mine from 1958 and 59, Tony Brandon Thaler, who was chairman of our state centennial commission. He used to say, a lean hound for a long race. Oh yes, well I'm here, <laughs> as long as I don't breathe <laughs> too deeply. And it does take nerve, let's face it, lack of judgment perhaps, to be the follow-up man to Terrence. <laughs> he has achieved immense reputation as a storyteller in today's parlance, where I'm just a raconteur to give the best face to it. He has the gift. He can extract so much from so little. He mentioned the Eastern Oregon gold fields in passing 130 years ago. When the first reports came down the Great River from Eastern Oregon gold fields, they said it was so rich that miners were extracting one and a half pounds of gold from a, each pound of rock. <laughs> and I often feel that Terrence has that power. The truth is we're within days of being the same age and we have something of the same disposition, if I may flatter myself a little bit. We're coming along into manhood about the time Thomas Wolfe, that is, Thomas Wolfe Sr., was writing his huge and endless novels, including You Can't Go Home Again. And we were both far away from Portland and the Columbia River for a long time. And I think we were both happy, relieved, and revived by a return to the wellsprings of the West, to Oregon and to Portland in particular. I, as it happens, <laughs> my parents were included in this, of course, I was born in Seattle, which I continue to love as I do Portland. But the profound difference is that I also like Portland, which is <laughs> different. Well, so much for preludes, I think, and despite the staff blandishments, let me tell you sincerely that I really nattered and hemmed and hawed about returning to the City Club rostrum. I was here a little over two years ago. Yes, just over two years ago. But the blandishments, the person said they, the ever mysterious they, wanted me to talk about the future. Ooh, my God in heaven. Futurists have their own place in today's frenzied scheme, and wise historians like Terence, <laughs> myself, we almost never discuss the future, especially knowing what we sometimes know. But, frankly, I'm still uh, retired now, but still reckless. I wanted to appear with Terrence. We're both identified as being retired. What a laugh. We are both at the very beginning of thinking about things. And down deep, we both firmly believe in man's progress, even though in our lifetime, most now realize that it is no longer a fact, no longer sensible to suppose with any confidence that mankind and our own race is destined to live forever as we did once believe. That's no longer a given here in the 20th century. But like that magnificent Anglo-Indian scientist Sir Peter Medawar, I think if I may presume that Terence and I might be identified with that astonishingly wonderful English philosopher Thomas Hobbes. 
He described life as an exultant state of mind, which is, I think, rather nice. Glorying, he called it. Thomas Hobbes, in the mid-17th century, likened life to a magnificent race with those in front in a felicitous state, a quaint old phrase, with no finishing posts, as Hobbes saw it. The greatest thing about the race was to be in it, not to finish it, but to be in the race, running hard in a daily attempt to make our world somehow a better place. And it was spiritual death, said Hobbes. That's what he had in mind when he said to abandon the race. To leave the course was to die. And there could be no satisfaction or contentment but in proceeding in the race. Hobbes, we're with you. I agree. Hobbes was one of the original go-getters. I thought of him with reference to the spring of 1954 when out of the blue David Davies asked me, wrote to Wisconsin saying, would you consider coming out to Oregon to lead the historical society? Sherry and I had almost completed a quite different plan but the prospect of returning to the West was just exhilarating. All other ideas became history. But first, I came out for a quick look, as some of you have done through the years. And just a few of you will now remember how shabby and tired and gray Portland looked in 1954. Gray, with fatigue, worn out is the phrase that covers it well. But I feasted on every shabby block. Tired though she was, Portland still had it, that indefinable something, style, flair, sang froid, poco curante, whatever you want to call it, Portland had it. And I'm not about to embark on any odious comparisons with other towns, not even Seattle. <laughs> Let's just say that there was an indolent charm, just short of torpor, no sign of frenzy or feverishness, but rather a confident sense of proportion about urban affairs in general. And her sense of place, Portland was very confident about her place in the scheme of things. In fact, oddly enough, that year, that spring, some persons had voted <laughs> in the majority to have a new lighting program and a memorial coliseum. The Lloyd family had dug a huge hole in the ground on the east side two days and nights of intense talks with persons interspersed with brisk walks along short blocks with cross narrow streets. Mr. Davies had shown me my hunting field. My knowing guide had pointed out the special water holes, the favorite browsing fields where the big cats of that day hung out. So many people to meet, such chats. I listened dutifully, listened and learned from Elliot and Henry Corbett, Aaron Frank, C.B. Stevenson, E.B. McNaughton, who, by the way, observed that I looked mm, like an Episcopal bishop in this particular suit. Well, there was Ed Sammons and Omar Spencer, Ralph Cake and Phil Parrish at the Oregonian. I was becoming exhausted being dragged around to see these people. Bill Knight at the Oregon Journal, Governor West, Oswald West, Ralph King, Mo Tonkin, Mason Ehrman. It went on and on. 
Dorothy Johansson, Elizabeth Ducey. You see, there were two or three Democrats there. <laughs> Charles Sprague and Nellie Pipes, MacArthur. It's wonderful. I noted how well they all got along together, marveling in their sweet harmony, not realizing until some time later that there were two or three dramatic exceptions, but where persons were willing to temper their personal animosities for the common good. And I learned that city government was 100 years old in 1951, although no one took note. There was little notice that Multnomah County was a hundred years old in the spring of 54. That is slipping away. But what a grand array of people they were. They were like Hobbes, go-getters. And there's nothing wrong in my saying now that this wonderful range of people were also tired out. They'd come to leadership late in the Great Depression. They'd fought tooth and toenail in the constantly changing town to produce every level and unbroken streams, goods for World War II, as Terence has noted, only to be have it snatched away by dislocations and a minor depression at the end of the war, followed by another war, which some persons <laughs> now called the Korean incident, if you can believe it. On top of all this was the Veldi Committee prowling about the country, unleashed by Congress to unearth communists, and McCarthy was on the rampage. So American life was in its upheaval. But the board members were into interviewing me, interviewing me, and grilling, I think, is a better word. But they had a sense of the majestic past we skimmed through with Terence. And they cared deeply. Most had been born in the Oregon country, and they grew up with the region, and they knew and daily supported the fact that Portland grew in prospered because of the land around Portland and the rivers outside of Portland and because of the men and women who worked in those ranches and farms and forests and orchards, sheep folds and beef corrals, wheat fields, silos, barges, goes on and on. Some of our people today have lost sight of the fact that this great city cannot exist without the countryside around it. Oh, I could get carried away and be reminded, as Truman Arnold, the great trust lawyer, said at the, at the, toward the end of his life, he said, I'm an old man now, and most of the things that I remember best probably never happened. <laughs> But those persons knew then, as some have forgotten, that the magnificent city that we enjoy couldn't exist without the country. But I remember the great excitement of Sherry, I, our young family coming here in <laughs> the summer of 54, which, by the way, it rained all summer. No contract, no promises, assurances of a good solid year's salary at $8,000. Luck, maybe two or three, but it was understood it would be sink or swim, fish or cut bait. The message was clear, but we all got together to do certain things. We thought at last it is the historical society's time. The great narrative historian Winston Churchill once said, if facts are lacking, rumor must serve. <laughs> but the plain fact was that I, <laughs> you like that one? <laughs> Say, let me mark that. <laughs> 
Oh, yes. Well, I'll tear a page here. <laughs> but uh, our building committee established in 1904 still had not a nickel in the till. Large number of very busy and otherwise committed persons that decided that this was history's hour. And I could do nothing but agree. And as I sat on the first Monday listening to the air raid drill, the siren howling over the city, wailing over the rooftops across the river, I knew that after three generations of real disappointment, we were finally going to put Oregon's oldest cultural institution in first-class shape in a world-esteemed plan. Our late period has been called the age of all kinds of odd things, but for us, it was the age of opportunity. So I was not given a job of reorganizing anything, but rather finding a way out of a long and deep predicament for our great learned society, which was occupying a grace and favor position in the old city auditorium where they had moved rather confidently uh, in the middle of World War I for two or three years in return for supporting the construction of the city auditorium on that site rather than on the east side. Lots of people saw no reason to change. But I can now say, being long retired, that I often thought of the sculptor Joe Davidson, who in the 1930s said that our country would be ever so much more pleasant if instead of the Puritans landing on Plymouth Rock, the rock had landed on some of the Puritans. <laughs> Well, he meant not all, just a few. <laughs> now, I want to withdraw from the never-ebbing sea of history, which I think Longfellow called it, and, and then briefly, in my madness here, in the few minutes I have, discuss the future of our esteemed club and, and the fact that I did this <laughs> briefly on the 50th anniversary, never dreaming I would live to the 75th. <laughs> it all seems like yesterday. Well, to give us all sharper meeting, I'd, I'd like to pose one question. What would all those ladies and gentlemen I just mentioned think of all of the changes, the improvements, the enormous plans, the overwhelming physical impacts, the visual impact and change in our city, I believe they would be shocked beyond measure and immensely proud, but as usual, <laughs> concerned. In the last generation, we've had a thickening of the social consciousness and economic life around us, which isn't a transient phenomenon. Oliver Lee Cromwell has stated it well, and he's saying the change in process was overdue, and it was not a phenomenon or a result of any villainy, but something that has simply come to us and is now a fact of life, a thickening fabric changing on an hourly and daily basis. And we are obliged to work with the basic American fact that the only constant in this many frankly dramatic and exciting lives that we have now, the only constant is change. As we move along the race course earlier mentioned, we must move with the times, and if possible, especially us city club members, 
persons in Portland and Oregon, possibly just ahead of the times now and then. I am, so far as I'm concerned, this means looking ahead, far ahead. Roscoe Pound, the great jurist, Judge Pound said, I do not see that we are today producing enough leaders. If long range planning is the key to Portland and Oregon's success, in my estimation, we have to agree with pounds saying diagnosis is the larger part of our task in dealing with any problem. Given a sound diagnosis, to find the treatment is largely a matter of time and persistence. Let me put it another way, if I may briefly. The great Walter Hagen, prince of the golf course, once said, don't worry and don't hurry. Bobby Jones, fabulous opponent, Harry Varden, said, never stop hitting the ball. That's for members of the, town, of the city club. Never stop hitting the ball. Because for us, this means planning all of the time with intensity, flair, with intelligence, with that vision thing, as our president says today, my classmate, the vision thing. <laughs> it sounds like, well, it's interesting. <laughs> and, of course, with the vision thing, we mean leadership. We make a lot out of the noble phrase on the Skidmore Fountain, in fact, I mentioned at the 50th anniversary, and some of you have obviously forgotten I spoke then, otherwise I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> but good citizens are the riches of the city. You all know that. And we've been blessed with a host of great citizens, some increasingly more generous in actions philanthropic than in former years. But now, I say to you, we're coming up short of leaders. One reason is that in our developing more economic systems, where some of those best people are now birds of passage. They're here today, they fly off tomorrow. They're transferred, executives on the wing. They don't put roots down here, as our leaders did long ago. And they're looking around all the while, very often over their shoulders, and with good reason. And this is a national problem. Dean Palmer of the Wharton School said, we don't have enough leaders. We have a lot of managers, short-term, control-oriented, report-oriented. Leaders think in longer terms. Grasp the relationship of larger realities. Think in terms of renewal. Have political skills cause change, affirm values, achieve unity. All right, you are Dean Palmer. So, we have to think briefly in these few remaining minutes about inspired leadership and the obvious endowments, other than the natural endowments and vision. Certainly to me, if I may say quickly, robustness is the essence, not simply physical robustness, but mental, the quality that comes to the fore in adversity, which we'll certainly be facing in the future, and a serenity of mind. Voltaire said, Oddly enough, of the great English opponent, the Duke of Marlborough, he described that as a calm courage in the face of tumult. And then, too, the determination and endurance to achieve together with those first qualities, positively necessary to have, as we work with this determination, 
some sense of how it fits with the usual strains of leadership. Women or men who are in the seats of leadership must care, among other things, for those persons who are their followers. Too often these days, this is shuffled off under the loose term of administration or management, so who cares, with subsequent loss of the vital linkage between the leaders and his or her supporters. Our leaders of today and tomorrow, as Charles Madden has said, they must have a sense of humor, if you can believe it, broad or otherwise. Uh, Madden makes the point he served with Admiral Cunningham in the Mediterranean in World War II. He said of this great naval leader, Viscount Cunningham, fighting the Italians in the decisive night battle at Cape Matapan off the Greek coast, Several Italian ships, heavy ships, were sunk, and one of his destroyer captains fishing a sputtering enemy admiral out of the waters of the Mediterranean, dark and teeming wreckage, signaled to the admiral that he had the world-class case of piles. Uh, and the admiral read the message and said, I'm not at all surprised. And uh, the laconic Cunningham sailed on, saying, not my problem. My problem is triumph and victory. He had the sense of resolution to my mind I sense for us a coming wave of caution and lack of resolution around us. So that we need, as Cunningham had, and some of our great leaders of World War II and subsequently, a touch of the gambler. I am not a fan of the Bonaparte clan, but the first Napoleon, surely one of our best corporate figures, got very close to the mark when he propounded, if the art of war consisted merely in not taking risks, glory would be at the mercy of very mediocre talents. And this is one of the reasons, I love this turn of events here, this is one of the reasons I'm so fond of Bud Clark, who's a risk taker who is going to need some support and succor on these remaining months, and he's won the right to it. Well, Terence, haven't we enjoyed this chat? Talked about the famous and the forgotten, about the fact that the purpose of all life is to matter, to be productive, to stay in the race, Heraclitus and Hobbes had all life as motion. For us, it's thinking motion, staying the course. Our leaders, too, you know, they have to be able and they have to have good staffs through their chains of command. Not only individuals, but endless committees and consulting groups with which we affect change in today's society. I'm reminded of the familiar story of Al Smith, the great New York governor, sitting in his executive office in Albany, and his private secretary rushed in and said, Governor Smith, Governor, the most incredible news, a man has just flown across the Atlantic Ocean by himself. Smith snorted and said, you interrupt me with news like that? Beat it. But listen, when a committee figures out how to fly the Atlantic, come in and <laughs> tell me about it immediately. Um, well, 
In conclusion, I want to suggest in the bright visions for Portland that I think they're going to come about. I think someday the magnificent park blocks on the west side, <laughs> Terence, will run like the splendid Ramblas in Barcelona, uninterrupted from one end to the other. You know, we still say God made the country, but man made the town. I think that some Elysian gods will have to have some hand in designing the changes which will return our Central Park blocks to us again. It will be a city increasingly ordered and great, but it's going to take some real fortitude and spine to figure out the rail service to our Portland airport, real spine to figure out how to break what appears to be a monopolies in Portland's downtown parking arrangements, <laughs> some backbone to eliminate the tow trucks racing up and down one-way streets in search of victims in the dark going the wrong way. Real vision to resolve the infinitely and comparison, you know, level-headed thought, the complex homeless problems, street drunkenness, wisdom to get the architectural preservation program back on track, patience and skill to rework the east side freeway opportunity, get the Willamette River banks back where they belong as places for people. We need to keep in closer touch with outreach other cities, towns and counties in Oregon and southern Washington working together to solve these problems, some of which I think can be done through these coming up centennial, bicentennial programs with the discovery of the Columbia River on the Great Oregon Trail bicentennials. So we need to turn up new leadership, eliminate as best we can the professional critics and carpers who are making some part of our lives the age of belly acres. Portland needs to fully comprehend how truly fine it is even now and how much it takes from all of us to keep it so. The strong, stable commitment, a commitment to move ahead. Well, I have lots of things I'd like to talk about. Better support for the county library, support for our great institutions that are not receiving proper city report or support, the opera. Every city these days should really have an opera. Portland operas rent performance and rehearsal space from the city has increased since 1988. That's reasonable. But it should it be 181 percent? And the same goes for the symphony, the historical society, the great art museum, all of these things. Well, we know that there are going to be some questions. Sherry and I are working, we're retired, we're working on North Pacific and Siberian studies, but we also are devoting a lot of time and effort to studies of the river fisheries in Oregon and how they can be improved. And timber, which we believe is a crop, but espoused by David Mason, we believe firmly in selective cutting rather than massive cutting as though wheat in the field. And we all believe sincerely that the mysteries of wood chemistry have hardly even been evaluated as yet. 
There is so much to do in that field. Well, club members, uh, we've had a brief glimpse at the future. It needs a hell of a lot of work, as someone <laughs> said. But as in other times, as we can say in Oregon, certainly, onward and upward. Isn't that our song? We can do it together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas Vaughn. Thank you, Terence O'Donnell. I do not regret to say we have no time for questions because this was a wonderful presentation from both of you and we've enjoyed it greatly. We meet next week at Pioneer Courthouse Square. Please buy your mugs and your tickets to the Cavett Dinner in the back as, we, uh, as you leave. We are adjourned until next Friday at Pioneer Courthouse Square.